This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you right there listening to this show right now. Thanks to all of you, including Hector Bones, Tim Ashman, and Johnny Hernandez. Coming up on DTNS, are there other ways to power cars than gas or electricity? Yes, and Tim Stevens can break them down for us and tell us whether they're any good or not. Plus, tech to let you mouth words without speaking and control your devices. And your digital twin is coming. Embrace your digital twin. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, April 7th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Reddit, I'm Sarah Lane. From upstate New York, I'm Tim Stevens. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. Oh, it's packed house today on Daily Tech News Show. Welcome into the club. Shall we begin with the quick hits? We shall, Tom. Twitter cut off access to its legacy API, disrupting operations for several companies that relied on it for things like embedding tweets. RSS feeder Feedbin, accessibility aids uh, T Weiss Cake and TW Blue, and several non malicious bots all lost access. Substack also having issues. Users report that attempting to paste a link to Substack stories in Twitter now shows an error message. Some users also report that on Twitter, any links with Substack in the name are stopped from being retweeted or even replied to. Although reporters at The Verge didn't see this happening on their account. So it's a little unclear if this is a result of the API shutdown or a separate issue altogether. Oh, I'm not sure what happened, uh, but The Verge has now confirmed that they have seen this. So that that, that last line should, should have been taken out. That's probably my fault, uh, but there you go. No uh, Samsung released its preliminary Q1 earnings. Projecting profit would fall 95.8% on the year, the lowest since Q1 2009. As a result, the company said it will, quote, lower its memory production to a meaningful level. It did not, however, announce any change to its planned investment into five new chip fabs in South Korea over the next two decades. Slowing PC demands have caused what was once a chip shortage to become a memory chip oversupply. You're about to get better graphic support in the Chrome browser, meaning better and more capable web apps. Google announced it will enable the Web GPU API by default in the upcoming Chrome 113 release. This API provides more access to a computer's GPU resources, with Google claiming a more than three times improvement in machine learning model interfaces. At launch, WebGPU will be available on Windows PCs that support Direct 3D 12, Mac OS, and Chrome OS, with plans to eventually expand to Linux and Android. Yeah, someday the browser will be all you need. That's what they keep telling me since Netscape Constellation in 1997. Uh, Nest and Google didn't tightly integrate their devices until 2018, but Google has continued to support the old drop cams and Nest security systems that came out before that partnership came together. Well, you know what's coming next if I'm bringing it up in the quick hits. Uh, yeah, uh, drop cam cameras will stop working on April 8th, 2024. Nest Aware subscribers can get a free indoor Nest Cam to replace the old version. Or if you're not subscribing, you can still get a 50% off coupon. Google is also ending the old and frankly, fairly outdated works with Nest connections on September 29th. There are better options for you to switch there anyway. The Nest app, however, will continue to work for your Nest Protect smoke alarms for the time being. Amazon prohibited the sale of the portable pen testing tool Flipper Zero, tagging it as a restricted product, and citing its potential use for card skimming. The device is used by penetration testers who help companies improve security. It can debug various hardware devices over RFID, radio, NFC, infrared, Bluetooth, and other protocols. Amazon isn't the only one targeting the device, however. The Brazilian National Telecommunications Agency started seizing shipments of the Flipper Zero over alleged criminal use back in March. But you can still buy it directly from the maker, and even for less than Amazon resellers were charging. Yeah, he probably should have been doing that anyway, so maybe it's a good thing. All right, folks, Engadget reports that a Cornell PhD student, Ridong Zhang, developed a pair of sonar glasses that use a system they're calling Echo Speech to send and receive sound waves across your face to let you read words silently mouthed by yourself. So you don't speak, you just mouth the words. The sonar, uh, like detecting a submarine, detects the movements of your mouth. It's sonar for your body. Uh, Sarah, let's talk about how it works. Okay, so two small speakers are placed under one lens and then two small microphones under the other lens. 
Inaudible sound waves go from the speaker, reflect off the speaker's face, and then arrive to the microphone. The delay caused as they bounce off parts of your face creates data that then can be used to model your mouth movements. That data is then sent to a phone to process further. So you don't need to look at a camera like you would with other types of silent speech recognition. The glasses require a few minutes of training, though, from whoever's using them. It can reach what they say is about 95% accuracy. So you might say, sounds cool. What do I do with it, though? You could pause or skip music tracks. You could dictate a message in a loud place like a concert, or maybe you're on an airplane runway. <laughs> yeah, you're working. If you're working for, for, for the airport. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You, know, you just happen to be out on the runway. <laughs> Please uh, don't do that. Yeah. You, you can enter <laughs> passwords silently by voice. You can synthesize speech for people who can't vocalize sound. I think that's a big one here. Cornell's smart computer interfaces for future interactions, or the sci-fi lab, is looking at commercializing this tech as well. So, Tim, we must know, do you want to silently worth uh, mouth words to control the next cool car that you get to test drive? Uh, yeah, I think it could definitely help. I, I don't find voice interfaces to be very effective in cars right now. And one of the reasons is because cars do tend to be a pretty noisy environment, certainly with a lot of the NVH going on in there, especially in non-EVs, engine noise, wind noise, that kind of thing. And, and you might have noticed, you know, over the years, as cars have been more dependent on voice interactions, the microphone has been getting closer and closer to your face. Now it's kind of embedded usually right above your head. Um, this would get rid of that. You, could, you wouldn't have to pause the music anymore when you're trying to talk to your car. You could just talk to your car without having to actually talk. And it could make uh, that interaction a lot more accurate, quicker, and less annoying to your passengers for sure. So I think it could definitely be a big step forward. Oh, for the longest time, I have wanted this to work. Uh, I, I know it's been in development in lots of ways, but like like Sarah said, it always had a camera. Uh, mm -hmm. This, if you look at the video from the, the Cornell research folks, uh, is just a pair of glasses. Now they're a little bit bulky with the with the you know in the, in the prototype, but but even though even considering this as a prototype, they're not particularly egregious. They're not not really getting in the way, and I'm sure there is a way to style these so you wouldn't even know they're there, and then. If it works as well as they're saying, 95% accuracy, I know most of the experiments were limited to like certain commands or maybe a little more expanded uh, vocabulary, but that's the kind of thing that you can train up pretty fast these days. Uh, yeah, I f forget augmented reality glasses or build this into augmented reality glasses. This this I absolutely want. I want to be able to do voice interactions when I'm out and about without people overhearing what I'm saying to my phone. I think that's the thing, Tom. I think everyone's going to be wearing glasses now, whether or not they need glasses, because you'll have AR built in, you'll have stuff like this built in, and uh, who knows yeah. what other kinds of uh, biometric authentication you could build in as well. And uh, there's a lot of reasons why I think this could be a really sweet way to, to build it on your face. I mean, a sort of the only silly thing I could think of that's, uh, I don't know, akin to card counting in Vegas or something is someone <laughs> being really good at reading lips yeah, and going, yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. I see what password you just used, or I know mm -hmm. who you're talking to and you're saying crazy things. That's a good that, point. Those are edge cases, of course. I mean, this is much more, I, I feel like, an accessibility thing than anything else. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna have to do like you're gonna always have to have a catcher's mitt with you and then hold it over your face while you <laughs> yes, mouth your yes. passwords. <laughs> yeah, we've already solved that part of it. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> baseball fixed this a long time ago. <laughs> yes, yeah. Sonar glasses, baseball mitt, you are good. Uh, yeah, I mean, 10 hour battery life on this thing right now. I don't mind that it offloads the processing to the phone for two reasons. One, it's on device, they're not sending this to a cloud, they can do it on, on, a, on an existing phone. And if I'm looking at this demo, right, it's wireless. You're not running a wire to the phone. So given the fact that the majority of us who would be wanting this kind of thing anyway uh, are able to have a phone with us most of the time, I think this is I think this has got a lot of promise of the things that like are in a lab at an academic institution that I've seen. This is one I, I feel more positive about. Also. This is a dumb question, but I bet somebody no else has the thing. same question. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, the only ones you don't ask. But uh, if you do vocalize, let's say I'm, let's say I do work in an airport. I'm on the mm. runway. No one's yeah. gonna hear me, right. and I'm, you know, I'm mm -hmm. mouthing something that might be garbled, you know, just audio wise. I don't have to be silent. The audio, oh, good point. just gets yeah. thrown away. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess you wouldn't, because it's the mouth movements that the sonar is looking at. It doesn't yeah. care whether you're making noise or not. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. But you might lose your voice if you try to shout above the airplane. Yeah. Well, you know, have <laughs> caution. That's always the motto here.
All right. The next web has an article called Digital Twins Could Save Your Life. Here's <gasps> how. You might say, what's a digital twin? Well, they're virtual versions of real world objects, often used in industry, like a model of a power station or maybe an aircraft engine. A new book talks about the emerging efforts to make digital twins of people, modeling all of their internal workings, like you would with an airplane, but it's a person. Professor of Chemistry and Computer Science at University College London, Peter Co Conveni, and Science Director at London's Science Museum, Roger Highfield, co-wrote a book called Virtual You, about just this process. They presented ideas from the book at the London Science Museum in conjunction with some other experts in the field. So you might say, digital version of myself, what would be a good example of that, Tom? Yeah, NextWeb uh, wrote up a, a lot of good examples here. The Barcelona Supercomputing Center, or BSC, is using their supercomputer Mare Nostrum to create something called Alya Red, A-L-Y-A-R-E-D, a digital twin of a human heart with 100 million virtual cells. Uh, that's why you need a supercomputer because you're, you're simulating 100 million individual cells. BSC is working with Medtronic to use all your red to do things like help position pacemakers or, or measure uh, the charge delivered to a heart. Comp Biomed is working with Germany's Super Muck NG to model blood flow in the complete circulatory system of an actual 26-year-old woman named Yunsun. Uh, they've been able to chart variations in blood pressure and simulate the movement of clots. Uh, there's more. Uh, some models have been approved for what are called in silico trials. So instead of in vivo, it's in silicon. They're, they're virtualized, uh, testing a drug or a treatment or virtual patients instead of using animals or humans. The US FDA, for example, calls this model-informed drug development, or MIDD. Uh, I'm not done yet. One more here. University of Oxford professor of computational medicine, Blanca Rodriguez, used a digital twin heart to test the effects of 66 different drugs and predict the risk of abnormal heart rhythms with 89% accuracy. Uh, that is better than research done on animals, which is around 75% accurate. So not only does it affect the animals, but is more accurate. Uh, so can we make me as a digital twin? Well, uh, here's how we would do it, Tom. Potentially, digital twins of individuals could be created from an MRI scan, maybe a wearable device that's giving enough data to provide a digital twin, genomic and biochemical analysis as well. A doctor could then use that twin to simulate responses to certain drugs or even certain surgeries. Then that twin could also be used to make preventative recommendations for diet and lifestyle. Yeah, just to fill fill your twin with, with a bunch of coffee Do, and cigarettes and the, see the what happens. <laughs> let's see, let's see what takes the twin down, and then you yeah, know a little yeah. bit more about how to live your life. Yeah, exactly. Uh, sadly, though, uh, an actual digital twin has not yet been created. Uh, to do that, you would need exascale computing, uh, of which there aren't very many exascale computers, uh, and they're in use for a lot of other things like climate modeling and aerospace and stuff. They're energy intensive they're expensive to run uh because you need to sync a lot of different models up to virtualize a human and it'll be a long time before we have the computer power to analyze people on the molecular level so until we get there if and when that ever even happens a digital twin of a human would have to be achieved by combining different simulations so some for cells like they're doing in the heart uh, but you can't do that for every cell so you're going to do some whole organs uh, and then you integrate them together you might leave some gaps of things that don't generally affect stuff as much uh, so you're fudging it a little but to help speed things up and, and plug those gaps you can use machine learning uh, to kind of bridge things that are always going to be true you know like canceling out in math that would leave you with a still useful if incomplete version that a lot of folks think could be conceivable within five years I don't in know, five... Tim. Tim, you ready for a twin? Uh, yes, I'm ready for a twin. But even if they're not able to replicate us individually, just being able to create models of, of you know, example humans would definitely go a long way to, for things like you were testing before, Tom, uh, testing medicine, that kind of thing, and even could do a, a big part of reducing, again, something you mentioned, which is animal testing. Animal testing is something that, you know, the best of us don't want to think about too much. Uh, and so that to be able to get rid of that would be a wonderful thing, but also it would make medicine a lot more uh, repeatable. Certainly there's a lot of error prone uh, procedures there. If you can iterate on a given test a thousand times in a day versus having to wait months for test results, that would mean developing new drugs, new, um, 
new vaccines and all sorts of things much, much more quickly and, and theoretically being able to plug that into an automated system that could then make automated decisions and maybe have an AI testing a million different drugs a week. Uh, and that could do some wonderful things as well. So I think that there's a lot of potential, even if they can't replicate us individually uh, and, you know, make individual guidance on our, our own uh, uh, dietary intake, that kind of thing, which I'm sure is coming. Uh, just being able to to test medicines alone would be a, a, a major, major step forward. I yeah, that, like the, that's already happening. And that's good, right? Yeah. The yeah. educational sector, I feel like, is such a big market um, here. You know, imagine, you know, a, a bunch of folks in medical school, um, you mm. know, trying to say, okay, this individual has some pretty specific mm. health issues. Mm -hmm. You know, let's all, let's you know, we, yeah, yeah, like, you know, let, let's use this twin. Let's see what happens you know <laughs> everybody gets a chance to care of Go right, for it's it. like it's like you're not in a room with a cadaver or anything like that like this is, yeah, this yeah. is all you know much more preventative you could practice I think on the digital twin of a of an actual person right yeah and yeah. then and then then see what the actual treatment of the person does compared to what you did in testing which i think is is an incredibly interesting uh, yeah, it, use it, for this it, it's almost kind of black mirror like which is the, the ability to kind of look in the future of, of you know what if we feed them you know 300 grams of fat every day for the next uh -huh. uh, 20 years what is that yeah. going to do to their, right. their cardiovascular system you, you yeah. can realistically do that you could look at the plaque you in their, their heart people. afterward that's a big preventative yeah. case right mm -hmm. like okay yeah. if you keep eating you want to keep eating the way you're at let me show you what your blood vessels are going to look like in 10 years mm -hmm. like uh -huh. now right. the, we we briefly mentioned ethical considerations because we assume you all are already objecting to, to this on ethical <laughs> grounds and privacy grounds. Like, yes, uh, medical data privacy is pretty good, but it would have to be very good in this kind of situation because you're going to be re replicating so much about an individual and in the wrong hands that could be absolutely misused. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done in that part of it, too. We should acknowledge that. Yeah, it's hard to imagine this not being used or wanting to be used by insurance companies to be able to then say, oh, yeah. there's no way we're going to pick this person up. Much like we're already seeing some aspects of that from DNA testing kits where that's then if there are any indicators that you're susceptible to given mm -hmm. diseases, um, there's already discussions about, you know, ways to protect your identity from a DNA test so that that doesn't happen to you. This is going to just make that orders of magnitude worse potentially. So, yeah, I hope that that kind of policy, that kind of protection comes before the technology. But as we've seen in the past, usually the technology comes first and then we're kind of left scrambling trying to figure out how to protect ourselves yeah no that's why it's important to note it at this point yeah, uh, we don't want digital twins to become the ultimate actuarial table uh. Uh, folks, uh, if you need a little pick-me-up after that uh, comment, uh, how about my new show, Top 5, at Daily Tech News Show's YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. You can not only watch this show there, there's a new podcast tab YouTube just launched, uh, and, and and Joe and Roger and Amos were on it, and we're in there. But also, there's the Top 5 show. Uh, this week, I'm breaking down the Top 5 K-dramas you can stream online. If you're into Korean dramas, or maybe you're curious about Korean dramas, see what I picked. Go to youtube.com slash daily tech news show right now, right now. Electric vehicles and EV batteries get a lot of attention, rightly so, when it comes to talking about environmentally sustainable transportation infrastructure, but they are not the only game in town. Uh, Tim has been researching alternative fuels and wrote up great articles for Road and & Track and Inverse about some of the things he's found. Uh, I'm curious to know, Tim, what's out there and what state it is in? Let's, let's start with hydrogen. How far along is hydrogen infrastructure? Hydrogen, yeah, is in a really interesting place. The technology for actually moving a car around but powered by hydrogen has been around for, for decades now. That's pretty well baked at this point. It's really the, the infrastructure side of things that is missing. Uh, in the U.S., there are, I believe, fewer than 30 hydrogen filling stations in the U.S., and they're all in California, which means that <laughs> if you've got a hydrogen-powered car, of which there are quite a few in the U.S., uh, you're not going to be really road tripping too far, which is a shame because that's one of the, the beautiful things about a hydrogen-powered car. But in Europe and in Asia, things are actually picking up quite a bit. Japan has made some pretty substantial investments in hydrogen, making it available to, uh, to consumers. And they're actually building uh, basically uh, the beginnings of a hydrogen pipeline from Australia. Australia has a lot of sun, a, a lot of renewable resources, uh, which are increasingly able to be efficiently converted into hydrogen. Basically, you can convert wind power or solar power into hydrogen relatively easily. And then they're, they're working on ways to put that onto freighters or tankers and ship that up to, to Japan where it could be powering cars. Um, so that's an exciting thing. And then in Europe, they're making major investments there as well. There's a, a lot of investments going around 2025. 
uh, which I hate to inform everyone is just two years away. Uh, 2025, uh, they're, they're expected to have a 10x increase in hydrogen production, and they want to have filling stations every few kilometers uh, available within the entirety of Europe, which is pretty amazing. Um, so that infrastructure is coming pretty quickly in the U.S., lagging behind, uh, but New York and New Jersey and a few other states on the, the East Coast are creating uh, a hydrogen pipeline, basically, or a hydrogen um, system where they'll be able to have, again, much more availability of hydrogen along the East Coast, certainly along the I-95 corridor. Uh, that's probably another five or so years away. But again, they're, they're showing some a momentum finally after decades of, of nothing. Yeah, uh, that, that's a, that interesting infrastructure uh, th there. Uh, we we looked into a hydrogen car, and we have places near us that we could fill because we're mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, California. Uh, but uh, it just didn't it just didn't seem promising. So this is interesting to note that there's there's more going on with this infrastructure than I think a lot of people would have thought. Yeah, absolutely. So. And hydrogen, of course, is powering fuel cell powered cars. So if you're not familiar with those, basically, it is an electric car. It has a battery pack on board. It's still emissions free. It's still an electric car. Instead of plugging it in the wall and pulling electrons out that way, you, you pull the electrons out of hydrogen effectively. And uh, so that means you can refuel very quickly. It takes about five minutes to fill up a tank. Range on these cars is typically on the order of two or 300 miles. So again, similar to what you get in a gasoline powered car. And they're still smooth and silent and everything else that we love about our EVs. So they're a really great solution. It's really just... Where can I plug the things in? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the big missing piece. Yeah. So if somebody says, all right, hydrogen, fuel cell, these are terms I've heard before. What about synthetic fuels? So synthetic fuels is an, another interesting development that's, that's really just starting to come out of the conceptual phase and into reality now. Um, Porsche made a big investment in a plant in Chile, which I got to go down and sample. I actually got to, to see the fuels, to smell the fuels, and to, to drive on the fuels down there. But the idea here is basically, again, you create hydrogen from wind power uh, through the process of electrolysis. Uh, but then what you can do is there's an additional step that was developed by ExxonMobil, actually, believe it or not, back in the 70s or 80s, where you can inject carbon into that hydrogen and turn it into actual gasoline. You can make diesel out of it. You can make jet fuel out of it. You can pretty much make whatever you want to. So the plan for this plant is to be able to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, capture the wind power from a, a giant wind turbine that's spinning on that plant, and then put it all together uh, to turn it into uh, actual shelf-stable gasoline that is chemically identical to the stuff that you get out of a pump. And you can burn it in your car. And because all that stuff came out of the atmosphere in the first place, it's all completely emission is neutral. Uh, and that's just really just conceptual now, but they're working on building that out and they'll be producing billions of gallons of this stuff per year in the very near future. Is there something that, that seems, uh, that seems to be great on paper, like, Oh yes, I'm emitting carbon, but carbon was used to make my gasoline. Yeah. Uh, how practical is this? It is not very practical because it's going to be extremely expensive. You know, this this factory took about, I think, $75 million to build, and it's going to be producing something on the order of 17 million gallons of fuel per year. Uh, if you do the math on that, it's going to take a long time to uh, to start to to um, uh, commoditize that, that price. But what they're hoping to do is expand that into other places in the U.S., get the distribution scaled up, uh, and get that cost down. It's probably never going to be as cheap as gasoline because you basically just pump that out of pump oil out of the ground, throw it through a refiner, mm -hmm. and you're you're good to go. Um, it's going to be more expensive, but with some state incentives, federal incentives, it could get to the point where it is uh, not that much more expensive. And given it's exactly identical to gasoline, you could just mix it into normal gasoline and effectively reduce the emissions of this, oh, okay. the, the fossil fuels as before without having to build up a whole new uh, uh, infrastructure. That's interesting. Uh, is anybody using that? Uh, so Porsche has been the main investor of this so far. They're going to be using it at their experience centers, which in the U.S., there's one in Atlanta and one in in LA. So if you go to those things and you do a driving program there, you'll, you'll actually get to burn the things. Uh, but future distribution, that is TBD. Well, uh, while we're thinking about uh, the next hydrogen vehicle that we might want to buy, we might also like free money. Yeah, we'll need to save up for that hydrogen car, right? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And I've, I, I've, I've got a way for you to get free money, maybe if you spend it fast or have already. So Google Pay's <laughs> reward program gave a bunch of customers cash in their accounts, anywhere from 10 bucks to $1,000. But it was not on purpose. Android researcher Michelle Rahman explained on Twitter that normally Google Pay users, some of them anyway, get you know some, a few dollars back, depending on uh, where you shop for various promotions, right? A little $3 back for shopping at a certain gas station, etc. Multiple screenshots show users receiving reward money for what the message called dog fooding the Google Pay remittance experience. 
For anybody unfamiliar, dog fooding is a way to describe internally beta testing pre-release software. Seems that this was mistakenly sent by Google to members of the public, just not internal testers alone. Some users received multiple copies of this message with multiple payouts. But wow. it wasn't exactly a monopoly bank error in their favor. The Google Pay team quickly sent out an update that read, you received this email because an unintended cash credit was deposited to your Google Pay account. The issue has since been resolved, and where possible, the credit has been reversed. Yeah. Our Technica says Google isn't going after you, though, if you already spent it. Like if, if they can't get the money back, they're well, going to let because, you have it. Because it's, you know, this is the the person who received the, the you know, let's say $1,000 probably knew mm, I wasn't supposed to get this, but it was sent to me. And if the money goes away, it wasn't that, my error. That's usually, that's usually not the case, though. Legally, they can still get it. Like, if you didn't know you were supposed to get it and you spend it, they can still try to get it back from you. I think Google's just like, that's not worth our time to go through all of that. Probably not. No. Yeah. Just lick your wounds, Google, and, <sighs> and learn from it. <laughs> learn from your mistakes. That's it. We're just disappointed in you, Google. That yeah, mostly we're because mad. you didn't send me any of the we're money. Not mad. We just <laughs> yeah. we just expected more. Yeah. More money. I'm learning about this too late myself. <laughs> yeah, I expected yeah. some money. Didn't get a thing. <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, let's do it. James in Columbus, Ohio writes, I will submit my contrary opinion to the one expressed uh, through email during your most recent show. James is uh, talking about our show yesterday uh, with Justin Robert Young. James says, I fully support advertising companies continuing to pay the bill for many of the services I enjoy. I understand they do this in the hope that I'll buy their product or service. I, however, feel no obligation to do so. I agree with Tom that ads can be useful because they inform me about a product or a service that I might find useful. I also acknowledge that I can find ads annoying and they're repetitive. They can also be a frustrating interruption. I'm unwilling to pay the cost that would be involved with eliminating advertising. And I also suspect that I would miss out on finding out about some things that are useful, beneficial, or enjoyable in my life. I would, however, like to warn that balance needs to mm. be maintained. When a product or service is overwhelmed by ads and the content shrinks to a point that it becomes less appealing or useful, I consider walking away. <laughs> James says, FYI, I am in no way affiliated with any advertising service. <laughs> I, uh, I I appreciate this, James, because I it's closer to the way I think, of course, uh, and we all appreciate things that are close to the way we think. I would like to acknowledge uh, more than one person who emailed in uh, taking issue with what I said yesterday, and I will back I will backpedal on that a little. I said everybody likes ads or something that I expect. I was overstating it. What I was trying to say was that you only dislike the ads that don't work well. There's almost always an example of something where you're like, oh no, but I like movie trailers or, you know, I like uh, hearing about new products, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think that there's, what I was trying to say yesterday is we only dislike the ads that don't work well because usually there's an example of something we like, but we all dislike ads because there are always ads that don't work well. And those are the ones that are annoying. Uh, we also got a great email from Mohan. When it comes to logging off, we talked about logging off and how log off options are buried or sometimes non existent. existent. Uh, Mohan said, Do I log out of websites? Short answer, no. Long answer, yes. I don't physically go log out of websites on my computers, but I do have an extension, Cookie Auto Delete, that automatically deletes my cookies after 24 hours. In turn, I am forced to log on to websites the next time I use said computer. Mobile phone is different, as I hardly use any apps, and the ones I do are logged in all the time, as they are used via an app, not through the browser. Cookie Auto Delete, if you want to make sure you get logged out, that's an interesting way to handle it. Yeah, that's a great way to automate things. Yeah, I like that. All right. What has Len Peralta drawn for us today? Is it free money? Is it digital twins? Is it alternative fuels? Len, what did you draw? Well, you know, I asked something in the chat room is what is the difference between a digital twin and a clone? I'm sure there is very obvious thing. Uh, that there is uh, that, that would separate the two. But you know what? That's the kind of thing, right? There's going to be a lot of questions about, hey, what about my digital twin? What about clones? How does this all fit into it? Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. a good brochure cover, um, which is your digital twin and you. <laughs> I think they would 
be handing this out in places where digital twins would be available or not even available uh, when you get your digital twin. Just, you know, a pamphlet that yeah, sort of explains yeah. everything that you need to know and how to care and feed for your digital twin. I things like this. that. Can my digital twin feel the same things I feel? <laughs> yes, Page exactly. six. Are we born on the same day? I don't know. <laughs> Questions like that that I think are going to come up. This image, if you're interested in it, is uh, available right now on my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. Just become a member and you get it for free. Or if you want to go the old-fashioned route, head on over to my online store, lenperaltastore.com, where I am currently taking commissions. So uh, so think about that. Pick up a, a print for yourself and uh, maybe something for somebody else as well as a gift com coming up. So there you go. Sounds good. Len Peralta, thank you for the work today. Also, thank you, Tim Stevens, for being with us and sharing some uh, some knowledge about the future of, of cars and everything else. Uh, where can people keep up with all of your work? Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, I think at this point, the best place is on my Substack, timstevens.substack.com. Even though he can't share it on Twitter right now, uh, you can definitely check out what I'm up to there. And I try to keep uh, some links in there of what I'm writing, where it's published, and, uh, and what I'm up to. Indeed. Well, we have got two new uh, bosses that we want to thank today. Our Chad and Jamie. Our Chad and Jamie just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Our Chad. And thank you, Jamie. We're yeah. so glad to have you. Keep it going, Our Chad and Jamie. Uh, and every, all the other patrons, welcome them. Make them feel welcome here. Uh, Our Chad and Jamie, you're welcome to now stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet, which you can get in your Patreon feed. Uh, Tim Stevens, you just mentioned to Substack, uh, on today's post, had some thoughts about how text generators are going to change journalism and likely the stories you read online. So we are going to talk about that with him. Or I could have put it this way. Don't miss out on the bonus discussion after Daily Tech News Show today as Tim Stevens dives deeper into his thought-provoking Substack post on the potential death of online media with the rise of AI. Stick around for some eye-opening insights and engaging conversation. Let I'll leave guess. it to you to know which of those was written <laughs> by ChatGPT. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy uh if you if you like quizzes such as these and by the way gdi has quizzes as well you can catch dtns live monday through friday at 4 p.m eastern that's 2000 utc you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live we're always on demand but we'd love to have you join us live if you can we are back on monday with justin robert young joining us have a great weekend this week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Don't fast forward. They need your uh, support. They need your acknowledgement. Well, I don't. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. Technical producer Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer Jen Cutter. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods be back. Master W. Scott Swan, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Gadarama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Contributors for this week's shows included Nika Monford, Ayaz Akhtar, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Tim Stevens. And thanks to all our patrons who make this show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>